Hi listeners, welcome to the next episode of Arnie Monkey. My name is Adam Barrow. Thanks for all the great feedback you've been giving us. It's been really amazing. And also for sharing the podcast. Remember, the more you share the podcast, the more awesome it becomes. By extension, this means that you become awesome as well. This week, we've got something really special for you. One of the great poets, T.S. Eliot, once said, Only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far it's possible to go. This quote perfectly encapsulates our guest today, Troy Bradley. Troy is one of the most prolific record setters in Bologna, having set 64 world records and too many national records to keep track of. He's been awarded the FAI Montgolfier Diploma three times, one each for hot air, rosier and gas classes of balloon, the first person to do so. Ballooning is a baseline of his life, and he's over 7,000 hours, and he's 37 years as a pilot, and he shared the joy of ballooning with approximately 30,000 passengers. However, it does help to get your hours up when you undertake flights that last for 160 hours. He's competed in hot air and gas world championships, has competed in the Gordon Bennett on many occasions, and bravely, on two occasions, he's flown with his wife Tammy beside him. He's also competed in and won the America's Challenge gas balloon race with Tammy. Troy's one of a handful of people to have flown a balloon across both the Atlantic and, most recently, the Pacific Ocean, and we'll talk to Troy about both of those flights. Troy's a passionate supporter of the sport, and he spent time as the President of the Balloon Federation of America, and he sits on many subcommittees for the FAI Ballooning Commission. Troy's a member of the FAI Ballooning Commission Hall of Fame, as well as the US Ballooning Hall of Fame, and he's also a really keen promoter of the sport to anybody who will listen to him talk about it. Troy's a father of two fourth-generation pilots who he hopes will carry the Bradley name into the record books well into the future. Now, just a heads up that this is another longish interview. Uh, we struggle with the audio a bit as well, so please excuse the poppy sound through the interview that's the joys of the internet, and we're using Skype for the interviews. On top of this, there's also a bit of work being done in my house at the moment, so you may hear a little bit of banging in the background as well. Now, on to the interview with Troy. Welcome to my monkey, Troy. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here uh, talking about balloons. Like you said, I'll be happy to talk to anyone about it, and uh, it is my passion, so thanks for having me. Mate, I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted by that introduction. Like, can, can you... When you hear all that sort of stuff, and there's a lot of accolades and a lot of stuff you've done, can you believe that you've actually done all this? It's actually you living this life that we're talking about? Uh, no, it, it truly is. A, it's a dream for me uh, to come true. Um, growing up in ballooning and, and uh, seeing the adventures of you know the past uh, people like Ben Abruzzo and Maxie Anderson and to be able to follow in their footsteps mm-hmm. and to push things uh, even further um, has always been a goal of mine, but to... As everyone knows, not all dreams always come true, but uh, mine definitely has. Yeah, and then some, I think. <laughs> yes. So yes. You've, you've done so much, you know, we can't possibly get through it all in today's interview. So we'll see, you know, we'll have a bit of a go at it and we'll, we'll tap on some of the highlights and, and maybe come at things from a slightly different angle. Not so, it, It's very well documented, a lot of the flights you've done. And sure. in, in the notes to the podcast, we'll actually put up links to, to your site and to some of the other sites that show some of this uh, in more detail. But, but I want to take you back to start with, and I like doing this with all of our guests, is to sort of go back to the beginning. Everybody's journey into ballooning starts somewhere. So maybe you could take the, the audience back to your first flight. I think it was with your grandparents. Is that right? Certainly. Yes. Yeah. So my grandparents were uh, some of the first balloonists in uh, Colorado. Uh, they purchased their first balloon in uh, 1976, um, a Raven balloon from Chauncey Dunn. And... They, uh, they were immediately hooked as well. Uh, my grandparents actually owned uh, the first Century 21 real estate franchises in Colorado. And uh, one of their agents was a balloonist, um, John McLean, uh, Ruth McLean. And they invited my grandparents out for a balloon ride one Sunday morning. And by Sunday evening, my grandfather had his first uh, balloon ordered. <laughs> and uh, so, so he, put, uh, he put Century 21 banners on it, and he was... Uh, Flying, uh, you know, real estate banners uh, long before Remax had even uh, had come along. So he was advertising and promoting his own business, and really the whole family became totally enthralled with this new sport that uh, he had adopted. 
and um, I was definitely uh, taken by it. Um, took a ride with him uh, right after he got his balloon, and then immediately started going to events with him. They were they were going somewhere almost every weekend, um, mostly in the central or western part of the United States. But uh, I was fortunate to be able to uh, to go on a lot of those adventures and, and races with him, and was immediately hooked with the idea of doing it as a hobby. Um, but once we were in a an event when I was 13 years old up in uh, Nebraska, Grand Island, Nebraska, and there was one of the uh, Anheuser-Busch balloons, the Sid Cutter ran, and uh, the two pilots there I got to talking to, and they said how they traveled all around the country flying um, at different events, the Super Bowl or the Kentucky Derby, and going to balloon events, and when I talked to them and I found out that you could get paid to do it, I thought, wow, that's the best of both worlds. <laughs> if I can even uh, go out and do this and make a living doing it, uh, and there weren't very many people back then uh, making a living at it, so it was definitely a, a risky step to take, but uh, one that I've never regretted. Um, always uh, enjoyed what I've done. And Troy, was were your parents involved as well? So they obviously your grandparents had the balloon. Did your parents also then get into it? Yeah. Or you... Yeah. So, um, so my my parents also they would come out and crew. And um, many years later, actually, after I was um, a certificated pilot, um, I taught my mother to fly. So we kind of uh, skipped a generation, but uh, did come back and get that one as well. So, so my children are actually a fourth generation on flying. Which is, that's just amazing. I, I can't really think of many other fourth generation um, hot air balloon pilots in the world, really. They've got to be some yeah. of the first. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty rare for sure. And, uh, and I just love that, uh, you know, that my kids have both... Uh, have such a passion for it as well and and, and it is a great um, multi-generational type activity you know it's not like you have to be of a certain age to enjoy this um, so my grandmother um, I think the last time I took her for a flight she was 95 she's still uh, she's still alive and kicking she's uh, 100 years old now and uh, she still loves to hear about all the flights that we're doing and and uh, participate in that way so despite all of the stress that you've put her through over the years she's still kicking on well yeah, yeah. I, I know I've uh, given a lot of gray hairs to my, to my <laughs> mother and my grandmother. <laughs> and so you, you, you're there, you're pretty young, uh, 11, 12, 13 in that age. Yeah. And, and then I think I read that you got your student license at 14, is that right? That's correct. And uh, and then I was able to uh, get my, uh, my private pilot certificate. Uh, I was scheduled for my 16th birthday, which is as young as possible, to do the check ride. Um, however, we had bad weather that day, and uh, the designated examiner wasn't available for another week. So, so I was actually 16 years old and eight days when I got my private, and then I got my commercial certificate on my 18th birthday, and then I removed the restriction for uh, the gas balloons to get get rid of the hot air uh, portion of it uh, when I was 21. So everything nice, pretty tough. nice progression through the you know keeping the the years nicely spaced there. Uh, yeah. So you go commercial, and then. You're then hired by the, the godfather of ballooning in, in Sid Cutter in Albuquerque. That yeah. must have been something really amazing, was it? It was. Um, so I was, I was very, uh, very fortunate. Uh, you know, at that time, Sid was definitely the, uh, the big operator um, in the U.S., flying a lot of corporate accounts, flying a lot of rides, um, and founding the Balloon Fiesta. So, you know, there was a strong tie there. And I, I first started working in Colorado for a couple of different companies, and then Sid hired me when I was 19. So uh, I came to Albuquerque when I was 19 years old uh, to work for him. And yeah, uh, like you said, the godfather of uh, ballooning, kind of. I was uh, I was so amazed to be able to uh, come and you know fly for Sid Cutter. And kind of a funny a funny story is um, years later, um, you know, my son became the youngest to solo in a hot air balloon. And it was right before Sid passed that we went to breakfast with him, and I took my kids, and, and I went there, and, and we were just having uh, some conversations about, you know, Bob, Bobby's upcoming solo and all this. And when we left uh, when we left the restaurant, Bobby, you know, at the time he was only nine years old, and he goes, Dad, I can't believe Sid Cutter knows who I am. And I said, <laughs> I said Bobby, I felt the same way when he <laughs> me. <laughs> oh, that's a lovely story. That's great. Yeah, so, so. so obviously Sid was a big deal even at the time. You obviously knew him as a child coming through as well. Had you met him yeah. prior to him hiring you or is it just off yeah. the cuff? I had met, I had met Sid um, actually a couple of times um, 
there used to be a, a pro tour that Cool Cigarettes put on in the United States, the Cool Pro Tour, um, and it was a lot of top balloonists back then in the late 70s, early 80s. And they had come through uh, Colorado, and so we had always gone out and uh, participated in that event, um, you know, loaning equipment to pilots coming through and stuff like that. So I had met Sid during that, and then also at the U.S. Nationals in Indianola, because uh, when he actually hired me, um, was in Indianola, um, and I was a competitor back there, and uh, he was a much better competitor, but I was there, and, uh, <laughs> and we got to talking, and he uh, said that he'd offer me a job, and I, I jumped right on it. You've got to you've got to grab these opportunities when they present, don't you? They might not come around again. Exactly, and that's that's kind of been my philosophy through my entire flying career. Is uh, you know, uh, don't pass up an opportunity. You never never know where it might lead. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you were talking about your gas rating then. You got rid of that gas res- the heater restriction on your license. When when did you actually get to have your first gas flight then? Uh, my first gas flight was when I was twenty one, and. Um, that was with uh, Jacques Sokup and Mark Sullivan. Mm-hmm. Um, they owned a balloon together that uh, Don Picard had built. Uh, Don built a couple of sport balloons, 1,000 uh, cubic meter balloons, and uh, they, they ended up buying one of those. And um, I got to talking to Jacques one night in a bar um, here in Albuquerque, and uh, it was you know one of those uh, over a beer type conversations and um, talking about gas ballooning, and he realized uh, you know my interest was so strong he said, well, you ought to come out and fly with us sometime. And I said, you, you name the time, I'll be there. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was uh, within probably two months after that that we were organizing a gas flight out of uh, Moriarty, New Mexico. And my first landing was out uh, towards Amarillo, Texas with him. And uh, I jumped right into it with the gas as well. Um, took another flight with him shortly thereafter. And then all of a sudden I was registered in the Fiesta event, which was actually we used to do a points-type race, you know, with mm-hmm. – uh, flying and um and i scored enough points there then i went to pennsylvania for a race and all of a sudden i found myself qualified for my first gordon bennett uh i think in 86 so wow. um yeah so it all went pretty uh, pretty quickly uh um from just having a, a general interest in it to uh, uh starting to compete in it as well and when you were sort of first starting out as a youngster did did you always want to do gas i, I think i read somewhere that oh um, like double eagle two which we'll come back to was in the air at the same time when you're getting your student license around that same time correct. so yeah, was that's that correct. that was sitting in the back of your head i need to get this gas rating <laughs> yeah i always had a, a strong interest in gas um it, just like today it's just just a difficult thing to you know find people that have the the equipment and mm. and the willing to go out and fly and teach and, and such so but I always had the interest. Um, as a matter of fact, I had helped build a gas balloon, um, actually a small rose balloon uh, with Nick Somm before I left Colorado that he set some records in, which I later went out and broke his records. Um, so I had um, I'd helped him build that balloon. I had seen, seen a few gas balloons during the balloon fiesta. Um, always had an interest, um, and definitely for the long distance flying, that always intrigued me. Um, ben and Maxie, uh, Dewey Reinhardt, all those people were my, my heroes growing up, and I was hoping at some point I'd be able to to do some of those types of flights. Yeah, well, that came came to fruition, didn't it? So that was great. Yes, it did. <laughs> yeah. So, so is it what? What's the process of removing that the heater restriction? Is it just is it one flight, two flights, three flights? How yeah. long? In in the United States, it's actually a pretty simple thing. Once you have a uh, a lighter than air certificate, um, it, issued by the FA, basically it comes and says that you're a lighter than air free balloon pilot limited to hot air balloons with airborne heaters so you're basically removing that that airborne heater uh, restriction on the on the certificate so it's not actually another rating it's just a removal of a restriction and we require um, two flights um, two hours duration each um, you have to have an altitude um, you know whether it's commercial or private as mm-hmm. to how hot you go above um, but basically a lot of people can knock it off in in one one flight by doing a, a land an intermediate landing and um, and that's what I did on mine. Um, we actually did ten landings on my very first gas flight, which is unheard wow. of in gas. Wow, that's a that's a huge number of landings. Uh, yes, it was. So it was a, it was a good good training uh, uh, flight for my first one, but uh, then I did go do another one before I was off doing it on my own. Uh, I, I didn't think it'd be uh, real smart to be out and flying after just one flight by myself. So, 86, you've qualified for the GBM. You headed over and did the Gordon Bennett, I'm assuming. That was the first one? Yes. Yeah, my first Gordon Bennett was out of uh, Seefeld, Austria. Um, and 
what was kind of uh, kind of funny about that was that um, you know here I am. I mean, it's like my fifth fifth gas balloon flight. I think <laughs> <laughs> I'm flying in the Gordon Bennett out of the Alps, and um, and I had a couple of people that uh, that had expressed interest in uh, in flying with me. Uh, one was David Levin, and uh, the other was Dewey Reinhardt. I grew up with both these guys up in Colorado, so I I knew both of them quite well, and I just thought uh, you know Dewey was one of my grand grandparents uh best friends and um i thought that he'd be a good uh good person to fly with and so i told him when we were in the basket that i just couldn't believe that uh dewey reinhardt was my my co-pilot <laughs> he's the one that had all the experience he had already uh, had his atlantic attempt uh you know so he was definitely one of our most experienced gas pilots in the u.s at that time um but dewey and i uh, we had a very nice flight uh, we had a different strategy than everyone else we tried to keep it uh low through the alps at night which with all the cables and everything that's a pretty uh harrowing flight um and so we uh we we kept it low in the valleys and pushed up into uh west germany at that time there was still the the west and east mm -hmm. and uh it appeared as though we, uh, through the night we were going to be just going right up that border we were trying to get towards scandinavia and it looked like there was a chance of crossing over into east germany so we chose to land so we didn't finish real well but um it was uh, definitely the experience of a lifetime to be able to fly with Dewey and, and to do that out of the Alps at night was remarkable. And that must have just, that, that would have just planted the seed even more, wouldn't it? To be over in Europe <laughs> flying gas balloons, like that's as pure as it gets. Exactly. No, it definitely it made, made you go, wow, this is something that I uh, definitely want to uh, continue with. Uh, the problem is that it's just such an expensive sport to, to continue with. And, and um, one of the things that... Uh, led to doing quite a bit more was um, shortly at, thereafter, um, Tim Cole and Dennis Brown um, came up with the idea of uh, flying with anhydrous ammonia. Yeah. And uh, they started selling a kit uh, that you could build a balloon and, and fly with ammonia. And as soon as I saw that, I, I called Tim, who was another old friend of mine. And um, we were one of the first ones to buy one of those kits and, uh, and build a balloon so we could start flying with ammonia. And this is great because this is, this is one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about because you know, it's it's something that not not many people have really done, and for good reason because ammonia will kill you very quickly if there's a leak. Yeah, well, yes, it will. <laughs> yeah, it's a dangerous dangerous gas to be playing with. Um, much more so than hydrogen, which just goes yeah. bang. Um, yeah. You know, it's you know, dying from ammonia is a pretty miserable way to go from from all accounts. So exactly. So what's the difference in the in the kit? What's what's the difference in the setup between like a regular gas balloon and one built for uh, ammonia? Well, they, they had uh, come up with this, uh, you know, the materials that uh, were basically what uh, they built um, life preservers out of um, mm -hmm. as, as far as material. And you don't have to be quite as um, diligent on, on the seams and everything because of the, the molecules of uh, the ammonia won't escape as quickly. They're not, not so small. Um, but we were still pretty careful in the way that we, we constructed this balloon. And uh, it's all heat sealed, so there was no sewing involved. Um, so we heat sealed it together and uh, had a lightweight basket built. Um, the, the downside to it is that you have uh, about half the lift of helium or hydrogen. Uh -huh. So that doesn't uh, give you a lot in the way of ballast. Yeah. And uh, it's the amount of time that you can actually stay in the air. However, for training purposes... It was great because we could go out and do a, a two or three hour flight and you were paying, you know, a fraction of the cost. At that time, it was probably about a tenth of the cost of filling with helium. Wow. So, okay. Yeah. So it was remarkably cheap. And so we trained a ton of people uh, to fly with the anhydrous ammonia. So it was uh, a good way to get a lot of people experience and it got a lot of flights under my belt as well, just from the instruction standpoint. Just really increase the accessibility of, the, of that type of flying, I guess. Exactly. And um, since then, um, ammonia has gone up tremendously in price. So now it's hard to justify the, uh, the cost. Um, and uh, kind of <laughs> what they use it for is uh, fertilizer in, in farm fields in, in certain areas. And there's only one, one place in, outside of Albuquerque that they actually use it, um, a little town called McIntosh. And it's a couple of brothers that have a fairly large farm uh, called the Swayback Farms. And the first time we went out there to discuss with them using the 
anhydrous ammonia from their tank to fly a balloon they were real excited about it <laughs> they said uh they said well you know it's probably not the smartest thing there's probably a lot of liability involved with this <laughs> we're gonna need to sign some releases and all that but um they said at the end of the day life out here is so damn boring that we'd <laughs> love to have you come out and bring a balloon with you if, if you guys yeah, want to so, come out here and kill yourself we're happy to watch yeah. Exactly. We'll check this out. And they were out there for almost every inflation we ever did. It was great. But uh, after that first day of going out to the farm, looking at the tanks and seeing about, you know, what we'd use to pull it off and, and how we do this. And they finally said, OK, we'll do it. But we go back into the house to sign this paperwork and everything. And uh, one of the brothers goes, man, this just sounds sounds like such a good idea. But what I don't understand is. We put it in the ground, and it seems to stay there. How do you think you're going to fly with this? <laughs> <laughs> but it's so a fair, fair question. How he, yeah, how he's injecting the liquid into the, the soil. We're taking the vapor off the top. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So so this is sort of through this time from sort of like, you know, 80, 86, you've done the Gordon Bennett, then you're going through, um, obviously, a number of gas flights, training a lot of people. You're flying commercially still at this time, right? That's correct. Yeah, I, still, I, was, I was still flying commercially, doing rides in Albuquerque and also a lot of corporate accounts. Um, back then, we used to operate a lot of national accounts through uh, World Balloon, Sid's company. So, uh, so yeah, in between, I was doing uh, a lot of traveling and, and flying rides and, mm. you know, and squeezing in the gas balloon stuff in between, uh, as well as I used to compete a lot back then as well. So yeah. I was staying, I was still staying relatively busy with balloons on, on all levels. And then, and that went to about ninety. Oh, I would say through ammonia. Probably my last ammonia flight was probably mid mid nineties. Okay. I would guess. Okay. So let's let's step back a little bit, a couple of years there, because there's a fairly substantial event that happens in ninety two. So Correct. when did that the the the, the Chrysler transatlantic flight, which is still one of the most in, for me one of the most inspired ideas for a balloon race that's ever occurred. Uh, you know, just it's ridiculous. It's dangerous. It's exciting. You know, it's it's at the front edges of technology. It's it's everything you could want, really, from a race. Mm. How did you go about getting involved in that event? Did did you get a knock on the door and say, "Hi, remember us"? Well, yes. Yeah, so so Cameron Balloons, when they just they came up with this idea, Don Cameron had actually come up with it years before. Um, that he wanted, you know, because he fell, he fell short of the uh, French coast um, only by about 100 miles, only a few weeks before the Double Eagle 2 actually made their, their crossing in 1978. Mm. So he was so close. I mean, within sight of the coastline, failed to make it to be the first. Um, and basically, Bob Rice, who did the meteorology for um, the Double Eagle 2, and at the time, Bob was the man for long-distance ballooning. But Bob had basically put a call into Ben Abruzzo, and he said, if these guys maintain altitude, you might as well not bother shipping your stuff or, or showing up out in Maine because they've got the weather to make it in. So that's how good it looked for Don. So that he fell so so close to being first, mm. it always kind of ate at him, and he wanted to still make a crossing, and so he had the idea of, doing a race across the Atlantic with identical balloons. So when they first announced the event, they had Chrysler as a title sponsor, but they had um, 10 slots available, and it was whoever could get the sponsorship to come on board. And so there was a price tag that was involved with that. And so all these teams from around the world started to uh, solicit all the sponsors that they could find to try to participate in this you know, upcoming event. And Cameron obviously had a financial interest in that they were going to build all these balloons as sure. well. But but Don was going to be one of the participants. So mm -hmm. that kind of gave you a good security feeling that uh, he was going to be in the air with you. <laughs> and uh, so um, so I, I actually hooked up with um, Dave Melton. And we were trying to sell a sponsorship. And at the same time, uh, Richard Abruzzo um, was looking for a sponsor as well. And... Um, I had taught both Richard and Dave to fly gas balloons and hot air um, from like 89 to up to this point. So they were both fairly new to being certificated pilots. Yeah. But uh, everybody in the world was having kind of an issue on actually getting a sponsor. And so finally, uh, Chrysler um, said, well, to save face, we want to still have an event. 
However, we're only going to sponsor five balloons, and we'll sponsor them all. Uh-huh. And and it'll be um, a multinational event with um, countries that basically the European importer represented. And yeah. uh, so, and being a U.S. company, that's why they wanted to have a U.S. team as well. So, so one day I just happened to get a call from Alan Noble, and uh, he said, "We know that you and Dave are wanting to fly together, and that's a it's a great team." However, um, we are now picking the teams because of, um, you know, Chrysler being the title sponsor. They, they have some criteria. You're the most experienced uh, Rosier pilot. Um, so I had flown Rosier balloons by this point as well. Mm-hmm. And um, they said, so we'd love to have you. However, um, instead of Dave, we'd like to have Richard Abruzzo because of the family name and the tradition and all that. So. They said, we don't know what you feel about that. And I immediately jumped on the opportunity there again. Not, don't pass up the opportunity. I said, well, I taught, I taught Richard to fly also. And he's an awesome pilot. Um, we'd make a great team. We're in. Yeah. <laughs> so it was really that that simple as to uh, joining. And um, and we were uh, both fairly young at the time. I, was, uh, I turned 28 while we were in Maine waiting. And uh, Richard was 29. So we were, the, we were definitely the young, young team out there. And it, it just, the event turned out to be quite amazing in pretty much every it, way, it, didn't it? There was lots of drama, it did. some ditchings. It did. Yeah. No, it was, uh, it was an absolutely amazing event uh, with five of us taking off within 20 minutes of one another out of Bangor. And um, it really shows the pilot decision-making and um, deciding what to do in a long flight like that and, and how the, the outcome can differ greatly amongst the teams. So um, we would meet every uh, every morning in Maine um, to have a briefing. Uh, the the main race meteorologists were uh, a Dutch team, and then a lot of us had also hired other meteorologists to try to get uh, maybe that edge on the race portion of it. Because the idea behind the event was the first person to cross a paved road in Europe would be the winner. Right. And so a lot of us decided that we would, um, you know, bring in more support and, and try to get the best team built uh, for, for the race portion of it. So we brought on board Bob Rice, who had done Richard's father's weather for across the, uh, across the Atlantic, and then he also supported, like, Maxie Anderson across the U.S. Um, another interesting addition to that, uh, the meteorological team, was uh, Luke Trulemans uh, was brought on by Bertrand Picard. Mm-hmm. So that was the first time Luke had ever been involved in something of this nature, and obviously he's gone on to make an incredible name for himself in uh, in the ballooning circles. Sure has, uh, yeah. Incre- incredible yeah. weatherman. Oh, um, amazing. So, um, so with that, um, you know, all the teams had some different strategies, and um, ours was totally different, and Bob Rice actually didn't even like the weather pattern that we were taking off into. Um, you know, as soon as we got the go from the Dutch meteorologist, we went back, we made a call to Bob and said, here's, here's the scenario. He agreed with what they were looking at weather wise, but he was a little bit concerned with whether we'd actually make it or not. So there was a concern in our head from the very beginning when our meteorologist wasn't a hundred percent confident. Yeah. Um, but he said that he felt that it may not be doable, but that, it should be safe that we'd probably end up down towards the Azores and at least land in good weather. So be similar to something like Ed Yost had had um, on his attempt in the Silver Fox in 1976. Mm-hmm. So, so the next meeting that we had with all the teams, we went around the room being the United States. We were the, the last to actually have a vote on this and everybody else in the room said, we're, we're ready to go. And Richard and I just said, well, you're not leaving us behind. If you're going to go, we'll, 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 we'll do it. And um, so we uh, started getting all the systems set up. Like I said, we set off within 20 minutes of one another wow. um, on that race. And as it turned out, uh, uh, Bertrand and uh, Wim Verstraten won the event. They landed in Spain. Um, Don and, uh, and Rob Bailey, uh, the English team, they ended up landing on a beach in Portugal, which I think was probably the most dramatic since yeah. they hit the first landfall right after crossing all this water. And uh, the German team probably had uh, one of the more exciting uh, landings mid-Atlantic in a thunderstorm. Yeah. Uh, 
and they were about 50 miles from our position when this was all occurring. So we're listening to their issues on the radio. We know how close the storms are to us and uh, just trying to maintain separation at that point. And the Dutch team went down off of Land's End, England. Um, we stayed up um, and were able to uh, continue a more southerly track. And the Dutch meteorologist actually had said that we should ditch while the weather was still good because there was no chance that we would make landfall. <laughs> well, Richard and I already had the idea that as long as we had fuel, we weren't landing this thing. It didn't matter where we were. We were going to keep trying. Well, we had a nice sliver, basically. It was a very fine line that we were riding on this wind because as you get down towards the Azores, the Azores high um, could stop you, but it also could start to turn you and rotate you going back towards like South America. So, sure. <laughs> so we didn't really want to, we didn't want a round trip, but we, uh, we held on to this, uh, nice little wind that we had and, and worked it hard for all six days that we were in the air and ended up east of Casablanca, Morocco, making the first U S to Africa flight. So if you look at the, the difference in between five teams, you know, only 60% made landfall and the distance in between lands and England and where we landed down in Morocco is about 1,200 miles. Wow. Um, in distance. So it really does show the difference in the winds at different altitudes and piloting strategies. And uh, I try to explain that to passengers with, uh, with those winds every morning. I think that's one of the, the best examples you can provide. So that was like six days, I think, that flight, wasn't it, roughly? And, and that's, was that Correct. your first world records that you achieved with that yes. flight? Yeah, that was the first world records. Um, uh, we actually set the absolute uh, duration record on that flight. We broke the dis we broke the distance, duration, and altitude uh, records for Rosier balloons, and um, and set an absolute duration record of six days, which was a big deal for us because it was the Double Eagle Two that had uh, set that duration record back in 1978. Yeah. So, at 137 hours so so that it was Richard's father that had done it it was a real special moment to, to be able to break that yeah to share that with him and you know yeah. son, son beats father it's the way it should be isn't yeah. it I think yeah yep exactly <laughs> so that, that just just an incredible flight all around and just an amazing opportunity to do that but that wasn't the yeah, end what? of your you know that just really said well here we go this is yeah this record setting stuff I like having my name in the record books <laughs> let's let's see what I can do to go and get in a bit further. So so then you really started focusing more on the uh, flying domestically, wasn't it, with some of your record settings? Yeah. So in your in the in the small uh, rosier that you built back in the day. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So I um I came back and um what what did intrigue me was yes we had set the record um, and Richard and I both knew that that wouldn't be the uh, the end of record setting for us because we, we really enjoyed that flight. We enjoyed, you know, being able to, to push something further than anyone had before. And, um, we saw, we started setting our sights on, you know, other things. Um, Richard ended up doing some AA six distance and duration records. I went for, uh, some smaller Rosier, uh, balloon stuff. Um, and I was really interested early on in the Rosier stuff since we had done the, um, Atlantic, because I had also helped Nick Somm build his Rosier back in the early 80s um, that he set some records in. So I started kind of saying, well, those records are, are open, and I think that they're, they're beatable for sure. Mm. Um, and so I started going after that. And to date, of, of the records that I've set, I've actually held the records for Rosier balloons in distance, duration, and altitude at some point. Um, AM1 through AM15, only missing the AM7 distance and duration records. So um, those are two that are still out there kind of dangling. and they're, <laughs> they, and they're definitely on my radar at some point. Have you just got those pinned up on your wall in your office? It just says AM7. <laughs> That's all it says in yeah, big well, letters? Yeah, well, and, and what that, that record was actually set, um, they were fairly close to what we had done in, uh, in our AM8 across the, uh, the Atlantic. And it was um, uh, the Spanish crossing of the Atlantic from the Canary Islands to Venezuela. So it's the first, uh, first and only um, uh, east or west to east, east to west uh, crossing of the Atlantic. And um, and they did a tremendous job on making that flight. And so that that one still kind of stands out. So that size balloon is definitely you know Atlantic capable. Mm. And 
yeah, so I thought uh, maybe another Atlantic crossing at some point might be a, a fun thing, and now I've got my daughter interested in that as well, so <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe I, the first father, father-daughter. father Father-daughter uh, crossing, that's right. I'm not sure there's a world record for that, but we can add it in there. It'll be a there you go. Fem- just, feminine just class. <laughs> so yeah. you, you did um, one of the, the, the flights I most enjoy, and I, I remember vividly reading at the time, was your amazing uh, AM3 flight. Uh, mm-hmm. The flight to be you know, the oldest record in the books uh, that you went oh. a very long way in a very small balloon in some fairly yeah. difficult conditions. No, yeah. I, and I and I, I'm, I appreciate that somebody remembers that flight because to me that's one of that's probably one of my favorite flights. Um, so it was actually the AA three uh, distance record, and it was set back in 1922 uh, by a Frenchman, and he flew 500 miles. And that one I started looking at uh, pretty seriously um, after doing some Rosier record. Um, balloon, the balloon that I had helped Nick Som build back in 84, um, without being a Rosier, taking the skirt off of it, basically it fit that category. It's about 13,000 cubic feet um, of volume. So I had contacted Nick and I said, hey, Nick. I'm looking at a record in the books that I think is breakable. I was wondering if I could uh, talk to you about your balloon. And um, he's so Nick. Nick immediately knew what I was looking at, and he goes, he goes, ah, damn it, you're looking at the same record I am. Mark. And he said, well, I don't know, is it the AA3 distance record? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, but you know what? I'm never going to do it. So yeah, you can borrow my balloon. <laughs> so. Um, so Nick was gracious enough to give me his balloon. Um, it had sat in the bag for a number of years, um, but we got it out. We did a test flight in Albuquerque with it, and everything seemed to be looking like it was a pretty good system for uh, for going after this record. So in 2001, um, we set up to where we were going to launch out of um, Elizabeth, Colorado, which is close to Denver, Colorado, and we had a great weather pattern in place um, for this record attempt. And at that time, my meteorologist was Lou Balonis, and Lou was Steve Fawcett's uh, meteorologist on some of the early flights uh, okay. that he. And so Lou was my meteorologist. Um, we uh, identified a good weather pattern, and basically he said, he said, yeah, you're grabbing a tiger's tail on this one. To uh, you're going to go all the way to Florida in 24 hours. <laughs> so wow. from Colorado. <laughs> And um, the problem with this small balloon, like you said, you're very limited on the amount of um, uh, ballast and, and altitude that you can achieve. So it's a lot easier if you can get above any of the convective activity or, you know, any, uh, you know, thermals during the day, things like that. We're flying such a small balloon here that I've got to fly at a relatively low level and have a lot of high speed winds as well. So a tough combination to try to, to find. So um, we identified the system, went to Colorado. It was a beautiful launch. The track was looking good. The one thing, we look at many weather models when I do any of the records, and all the, all the models were in total agreement except for one. And it's called the, MM, the MM5, and it's a military model. And this military model was showing just a, a small area of uh, snow showers in the Texas panhandle which is kind of in our track. And because none of the other models were picking this up, uh, we decided, let's go for it. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and launch. Um, this probably won't be there. Well, uh, sure as can be, it was there. <laughs> so, so I arrived in the middle of the night, flying through the Texas panhandle. I'm at about uh, 5,000 feet above ground, maybe, and it begins to snow on me. Nice. And, uh, yeah, so... I'm, uh, I'm in this very tiny little solo system gondola, which is uh, no bigger than like basically sitting on your toilet. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I wrapped some, uh, some uh, space blankets around it to kind of keep the snow out. And I called my crew, called my wife, and I said, well, the good news is, you know, right now I'm doing 50 miles an hour or whatever. And uh, the bad news is I'm being snowed on. So. <laughs> so, and just that small of a balloon with getting the weight of the snow um, started to push me down and, um, I just couldn't get rid of the weight. There was no way to. And, uh, so I was, I was going through it, uh, through the night about a bag of ballast every hour. And, uh, that was unsustainable for, for the size of the balloon and, and what we were trying to do. So I ended up doing a, a night landing on that. And I think I traveled somewhere over 300 miles on it, but, uh, not getting the record, but 
thinking, you know, how do I go about this differently the next time? And so, so that must have been so the, one of the first times you've ever set out to to correct. do a record and and not get it. Yep, and not and not come away with something exactly right. Well, I, so, I don't. From what I know of you, Troy, I don't think that would have sat well with you. No, it didn't. It didn't at all. So I was very very frustrated by that. So the next morning, I met I met breakfast with my crew before we were going to pack up and you know take everything back to Albuquerque. And, uh, and sitting at breakfast, uh, you know, we started discussing the issues with it. And, and basically, um, my idea that I came up with was, uh, the one that my wife hates the most is throwing some money at this might solve the problem, <laughs> or which, which meant building, building a new balloon, um, and a little bit larger, maybe it'd give us a little bit more, um, chance at this. So, so we had Bert Padelt build a, uh, a 14,000 cubic foot balloon. So slightly larger but still fell into the AA3 category and um, came back the next season so 2002 and um, started looking at it a little bit differently thinking well if I could get a little bit more duration out of this then I don't have to fly quite as fast and maybe a better weather system and so we identified a new system um, weather system chose a new launch site Um, I ended up going to Amarillo um, instead of back to Colorado, which immediately bought me a little bit more um, ground. Um, you know, you're not as high above sea level, sure. so that's giving me some more lift right there. So I didn't have to go as high to get the same kind of conditions. So um, so Amarillo was the launch point that we decided upon, and um, it was a pretty pretty windy night that, uh, that we ended up going out of there, but it was a really good weather pattern. It was going to take me up to the northwest. And we, uh, when we were setting up out there, my mother was out at the, at, out at the launch as well. And, uh, she was getting nervous. She could see how the, the, the load tapes were just flapping in the wind. I mean, it was making a <laughs> horrific noise and whipping around and, and I'm putting on a helmet <laughs> and she's like, she's like, are you really sure this is a good night for ballooning? I said, no, it's really, it's, it's really not a good night for ballooning, but it's a hell of a night for a record setting flight. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, now this time, so, Troy, before you took off this time, did you check MM five? Was it? Uh, yes, yes. Again, we checked it again, exactly, <laughs> and everything looked clear. And um, and so we uh, we uh, went ahead and launched. And the the problem with that night, though, was that Lou Balonis had told me he said, "You don't have any bailout options this time. You don't have a bailout. It's going to be so fast below you that first night, you'll kill yourself if you try to land." And yeah, so, good advice. Uh, Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. I was like, great. <laughs> so there's an incentive to continue going, right? And after 30, 35 and a half hours of flying, flying time, I think um, I landed uh, just past uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, went 1,225 miles. And like I said, the previous record was 500 miles. So that's the one that I've beaten by the the greatest margin for sure. That's that's really like being really unsportsmanlike you know when you go and you <laughs> yeah. do that you're really not letting anyone else have another go at it are you <laughs> it, it's it's gonna be a that's gonna be a tough one to break well well my goal on that was the record had stood for 80 years i hope it can stand for another 80 now under my name <laughs> I, I think you're pretty safe it, yeah. it might just be one of your kids who goes out and takes it so. yeah savannah savannah got the weight for it for sure that's uh that's the scary part <laughs> hi everyone how cool is this guy The interview gets even better after this break. Now, we know people need a toilet break or time to duck out for a cigarette. This is your chance. Get up, stretch your legs, maybe ring your mum, maybe tell her about Only Monkey. Just pop us on pause. We'll still be here when you come back. Go on, go on, go and do it. Stretch your legs. It's also a great chance to remind you all to share Arnie Monkey with everybody you know on Facebook. I know we keep telling you this, but it really helps, as does subscribing to the podcast. Okay then, back to Troy. So we'll jump forward a few years because obviously you've still done a lot of extra record setting in that time. Yep. But I just want to have yep. a quick a touch on the, obviously the, you know, what to me seems like an amazing flight in, in, the, in the two Eagles flight. And, you know, it's, we all, we all watched it. And, and that's yep. the thing for me about this flight. I think it's incredible, like, is that, from when you really started looking at this flight, which is back 2006, 2007, somewhere around there, wasn't it? Yes, yes, it was. The balloon was actually built in uh, 
2005, and we shipped it over to Japan in 2007. Uh, wow. so our first attempt was uh, was the 2007-2008 winter, and uh, we never got the weather. Never so, got the weather. Yeah. But it's amazing, isn't it, that the technology that was around um, uh, to, to broadcast what you're doing between 2007 and 2015 is uh-huh. so so different. And I think that's one of the greatest successes of Two Eagles is really is that is just connecting the planet it's probably the most watched balloon flight in history, I think. I it's think got to so. be close. No, it was amazing, uh, like you said, with the, the technologies. And Tim Baggett does all of the, the tracking um, and building the maps and doing the tracking programs for us and everything. And he did a fabulous job. And, yes, for the amount of exposure we got, because it was a privately funded deal, it wasn't like a sponsor that was looking for a bunch of hits on the on the web or anything like that. Yeah. Um, it just drew everybody in, um, and we just had tremendous coverage on it, and the tracking system worked beautifully, and we, it's not like we were competing against anybody like you are in a Gordon Bennett or anything yeah. else, so we were completely open with the entire thing, so anybody could check, you know, lat long, track speed, altitude, we were willing to share everything with everything. the world so that yeah. it was all working, yeah. And, and so you, you touched on there, you said, like, obviously, 2007, the balloon, you tried for 2008. I think the balloon was a 350, is that right, in size? Correct, correct. So it's uh, 10,000 cubic meters, 350,000 cubic feet. And, and was uh, that built by Burt again? Is that another Burt yes, special? Yes, that was, that was built by Burt, and um, the capsule the capsule was actually built in Albuquerque um, by a local company, uh, the, a guy that helped build the Double Eagle Fives uh, capsule. So it was kind of an interesting history for him also to uh, to build my capsule as well. And to come back to it, so you, you didn't. Yes. You were there. You sent the advance team over. They go over early, get everything ready, which includes Bert, I think, didn't it at the time? Yes. And, and the guys who know the capsule and they get everything set up and ready for you. Yes. And then you guys look for the weather. You find a window and you head over and you, and you sit there and wait for these these weather windows to come through in in two thousand and eight. Correct. Yeah. So so we went um, two thousand eight. Actually, I was there the entire time uh, from the moment the balloon arrived. And uh, and sat there for the entire uh, winter, basically, and shut down. And we made that determination in 2008, at the end of February, that you know either we could leave the balloon there in Japan, or we could ship it back to the U.S. and then ship it back when we're ready. And my feeling on that was that uh, there's a a strong possibility that it could be a a dead project. Um, you yeah. know, it was. It was it was personally financed uh, between uh, Peter Cuneo and myself at that time, and I thought if I ship it back, uh, there's a good chance that uh, you know we'll never ship it back again, and so it'd just die in you know warehouse. So we thought, well, if it's going to die, let's leave it in a warehouse here. So uh, <laughs> so we ended up renting a warehouse, um, um, which anybody that's been to the Saga event knows Koga Electric, where mm-hmm. a lot of the equipment uh, is at. Uh, we had one of their warehouses in there, and. Uh, yeah, we kept all the equipment over there for seven years, I guess. <laughs> so, um, long, long time. Long because time. Ba- yeah, basically, uh, a couple of things didn't play in our favor. Uh, the weather didn't play that year, but also, almost immediately following that, the price of helium really began to skyrocket, and yeah. um, and the price of the project skyrocketed as well with that. Uh, and um, so, with that, it was like we just decided we had to come up with some sponsorship or a different route of uh, how we were going to tackle this because uh, it just became too expensive to do it uh, on our own. On your own. So, so that, yeah. that 2008, you cancelled that. That, that. that must have been just, like, hugely disappointing. To, to... It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. Um, uh, because I don't know um, how many people would remember, but also there was another attempt in 2008. We weren't the only balloon trying to fly across the Pacific that yeah. year. Um, the other person that was flying was uh, Michio Kanda, Michio, yeah. um, and Michio, tremendous record setter, wonderful stuff that he had done record-wise, and his idea was to do a hot air balloon like uh, Perrin and Richard had done um, years before, and so he was after the hot air distance and duration records, basically, um, flying a home-built um, million cubic foot hot air balloon, and the... The weather system never set up properly that year. Like I said, our my meteorologists never were able to identify a good weather pattern. 
And yet Michio had done a couple of attempts that he saw what he thought was good weather systems. And he was taking off closer to Tokyo. We were down by Saga. Yeah. And, um, and when I got a call from uh, Sabu Ichiyoshi saying, you know, Michio's going to take off. You ought to come up. And it's like, sure. So I'm on the train going up. And then he canceled. But then a few days later, he decided he was going to try again. So I called my meteorologist and I said, hey, guys, what, what, are, what, are, what is he looking at? Why is he seeing something that we're not seeing? Why are we not flying? And he is. <laughs> you know? And, um, and uh, right then, he, um, Lou, on that one, he said, um, we don't know what he's looking at because uh, he's going to go into a heavy area convection if he takes off on this flight. And basically, Michio, when I arrived at the launch site and trying to talk to him about this, he just shows me the uh, high split trajectory models, um, which show right to the U.S., but, you know, that doesn't account for what's in between. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and uh, that was the problem with some of the logic, I think, that he was looking at. And, you know, 18 hours into his flight, uh, he was never heard from again. So um, struck by lightning. Um, you know, huge convection. We did some forensic meteorology on it after the fact that uh, showed the, the area he was in. There was, the tops were probably going to, towards 45,000 feet. Wow. Yeah. Not a good place to be. Not at all. Not at all. So, so with that, that's why I said it was kind of bittersweet that we canceled that year. I mean, mm -hmm. we saw that the weather pattern never was there. And it became easier to explain, especially to the Japanese media and all of our volunteers, as to why we didn't fly. They, yeah. they finally understood. Because there's so many days you'd go out in the morning in Saga, we'd be out flying hot air balloons for fun. You know, sure. and they'd be like, well, it looks good. Why aren't you taking off? <laughs> it's, it's good here, but, you know, we're looking, you know, 6,000 miles downwind here, too. <laughs> yeah, that's it's something you said, then is something I wanted to touch on as well in, while talking to, is that it's... And I'll go into some of the team stuff a bit later, but just around that disappointment is that you do have a lot of people there on the ground assisting you or volunteers and helping. And so when you say we're not going, uh, mm -hmm. obviously they're very disappointed as well. And do you find that do you find that you're sort of carrying some of that disappointment for them uh, as a team oh, leader? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. No, I mean you can feel it. I mean these people put in so much time and effort and. And, uh, and you become, you become like family with them as yeah. well. You know, it's not just uh, a group of volunteers. You, you're, you're, you're having meals with them. They're inviting you to their house. We're having, you know, group meals at restaurants. I mean, just, uh, they become so close to you that, uh, yeah, you really feel for them because it's like, it becomes their project as much as mine, honestly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but you still have to stay selfish at the same time, don't you? Like, oh, totally. It's really important to stay, to keep that desire and that drive. Yes, yes, exactly. So you have to keep uh, keep everybody excited about the project, but also uh, understanding that you don't want to jeopardize anything by going into the wrong wrong weather system. And that's what's always paid off for me on, on all the records that I've done is I'm patient. Um, yeah. And I would say if, if you're patient, Mother Nature will um, grant you the right window, but uh, you can't force it. No, you can't force it. So it's... Um and the thing about this and this record setting, I think that those of us who haven't done these these flights look at, we just go, it's just so dangerous. Uh, there's, it's inherently dangerous already. Aviation, you know, if you make a mistake, yep. it's a very unforgiving sport or very unforgiving yes. activity. But it, it was very real for you because you've got uh, Michio in 2008, um, who has had the issue. He's, he's not heard from again. And then it was 2010, wasn't it, when, you know, when Richard... And, Correct. and Carol were also then were killed in the Gordon Correct. Bennett while competing with thunderstorms. Yeah. So this must yeah. really weigh very heavily on you when you've got these these friends and uh, you know colleagues who are out trying to do what you're doing. Yeah, must really play yeah. on your mind. Yeah, no, it definitely does, and um, and it's actually a reason that I no longer um, I don't fly the America's Challenge or the Gordon Bennetts um, because of. Um, I've had so many that my hairiest flights have been during those two events, um, as far as weather, um, because you're not calling the, the, the day you're, you're on their schedule. Mm -hmm. And so basically when, uh, the, the event director for either of those two events is looking at it, he's looking that you can fly safely for 24 hours. And that's the limit of his, you know, commitment to basically launching the, the balloons. And, as we've seen in so many of these Gordon Bennett's recently, um, and some of the America's challenges as well, some of the weather that the pilots will push into to try to win, um, 
is far less than ideal. And, um, and Richard and Carol were in one of those, those situations where um, going for the trophy meant more than trying to be safe and make a smart move and land it in Italy. They chose to uh, continue across, and they knew the dangers, and they knew what the uh, likelihood of thunderstorm activity in the area was. It was not, that wasn't a surprise. Um, so when I do when I do my stuff, um, you know, I'm calling the shots. I'm I'm the final say. Um, it's we're looking at it, but I got a great team of people that I know that care about me and <laughs> want to make sure that uh, you know this all works out the way yeah. it's supposed to. And so, um, you know, I have total faith in that. And so I really feel that when I do the records, I'm actually getting uh, longer flights than a lot of these Gordon Bennett's or America's challenges with a, a, a fraction of the risk involved okay. because we're going for the right weather pattern. Do, do you end up, obviously, at different points in any flight that you can experience levels of fear? You know, there's mm-hmm. points where you just go, <laughs> yeah. oh, my God, what the hell am I doing? And other oh, points yeah. of just absolute ecstasy. But how do you go about managing the fear is it is it having that great team behind you or is it knowing the systems inside out or or is the fear actually part of the attraction um no i i don't like to be afraid <laughs> so, <laughs> i'll tell you right now i'm not i'm not an adrenaline rush junkie here um i my my desire with record setting and what i see is a uh you know a reason for me to go do this because none of this gives you anything more than the ability to say you did it because it's not there's no financial gain there's no uh you know it's not rock star status we're we're balloonists out here we're not (laughs) doing it for the world most people don't even know what we're doing or why we're we're doing it um so really it's it's a personal satisfaction and my my thing has always been that i look at all these records and i look at them and i say what could be done differently that could have been made this even better so i i give kudos to absolutely everybody that's ever come before and what they've done record wise and you're dealing with what you have at that time and and seeing what you can possibly you know get out of something but i always look at not only what did they do right to get the record but what did they do wrong there has to be something that they missed that i could capitalize upon and make it go even further and so to me anybody can sit down and have those theoretical kind of conversations and you can be what we, what we call in the United States, a Monday morning quarterback. How could that (laughs) play better? Um, But everyone can do that. But if you don't go out and actually do it and practice, um, it's kind of meaningless to me. So that's, so what's more enjoyable for you, Troy is, is, is it more enjoyable for you is, is the planning and execute like the execution of, is that more enjoyable than the actual flight itself? I love the planning. I love the planning. I love putting it together, um, building the right team, getting the equipment uh, right. Doing all of that is a, is a big rush for me. But there again, I'm still a pilot, and I still absolutely love flying. And the draw to the Pacific um, was, you know, playing on my Atlantic flight as well, just because that played in my head for so many years that uh, I wanted to go do an, another ocean crossing because it was such a, a magical experience. So let's go back to the uh, the crossing. We sort of went off on a tangent there, which is always fun. The uh, so you, 2008, you get back there. Uh, sorry, what I'm saying, 2014. Yeah, let's let's go. We decide it's time to go again. So mm-hmm. you send the team out again. They go and they're ready to go. Um, Correct. Everyone's ready to go, and you arrive there, and you say, okay, let's sit and wait for the window. But you had a couple of cancellations, didn't you, in the process Correct. before you went? Yeah. So our our window really was opening up. Um, January 1st is what we, well, I take that back, not January 1st, it was more like January 4th, I think was about the first window. In Japan, um, New Year's is a big to-do, and it's not just on New Year's Day or New Year's Eve, if it's, uh, you know, it's like a week-long celebration and everybody's off, and so um, we were told that we wouldn't be able to get helium probably until like January 5th or something like that, and so really that's when our window was going to be opening, but we arrived on New Year's Day. And, uh, and then we're ready to sit and look. Well, on this attempt, I was using Luke Trulemans for my, my meteorology. And Luke, um, he's more aggressive than a lot of the other meteorologists and, uh, and really good at what he does. Um, I had worked with Luke on some Gordon Bennett stuff as well, um, uh, working as a team with him on one of the Belgian teams. And um, so I, I'd seen his style. I saw how he worked. And I knew he was looking at a lot more than some other people may look at. And, um, and so 
I felt confident that he would find something. I didn't realize he'd find it so quickly, um, but he did find a window um, pretty early on. And so we kind of alerted everyone. It looked good. We're, we're calling people. People are coming over from the U.S. My wife and my son came over then. Um, and um, then at the very end, it kind of dissipated, you know, on, mm. on the weather. So when you're calling that far out, the hard part in Japan, unlike some of the other records that I've done in the United States, is there's not enough helium delivery system. I, I should say not helium, but the delivery system with the trucks to be able to bring that much helium to one point and sit and wait. They don't have enough trucks to do that because they have other uses for, for those trucks delivering to other places. So so basically what we had to do was give them um, almost three days notice um, to say we have a window on this day. So that, that meant Luke had to look out not only for those first three days for when we're looking to launch, but for the seven days of flight time basically. So he's, he's doing a 10-day forecast out before we can even order the helium, yeah. that he has enough faith in that. So when those helium trucks come, you know, that's three days after what his initial look at it was. That could change dramatically, and it did on two occasions, unfortunately. Mm. So basically, we would have those helium trucks show up. We had one coming out of Fukuoka, one out of Osaka, and one out of Tokyo. Wow. And uh, so when they would, they would come there was a charge for delivery. So we never even cracked a tank on, on any. <laughs> and each time we were charged an astronomical sum just for delivering it there. And it's a long way from Tokyo to Saga. It is. They, they, they'd have to ship that down. And so these three trucks, they'd show up every time, but then we'd turn them around and they'd say, okay, if you're not flying in the next day, then we're, we're leaving. So we, uh, we actually ordered in the helium three different times uh, by wow. the time we finally flew. Uh, what, what's kind of funny is not only did we order in helium, we would go to, this isn't like typically coming into a country. Um, so every time that we were getting ready to leave, you'd have to get a, you know, an exit visa, basically, you know, that you're leaving the country. You, they're, they're going to stamp your stamp passport. Your passport. Yep. Yeah. So Leonid and I would have to go down to the immigration office in Saga every time and we'd have it stamped that we were leaving. And then <laughs> After, after we cancel and send the helium back, we'd have to go back down there and get another stamp. That, okay, now we're staying. <laughs> so, Hi, it's us again. Good to see you again. Yeah, so it's, it's some very interesting passport entries. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so you, finally, the weather's great. You, you take off a little bit later than you would have liked. I know that. And then, Correct. And that, that changes your track. And then the, one of the most amazing things I, I, I think about this flight, and I was watching the launch in the first part, and I had friends... Um, in the compound with you as part of your team who were sending me pictures mm -hmm. and Facebooking live. It was fantastic. But the, yeah. the the most amazing thing is that you pretty much flew straight over the top of Tokyo, one of the oh, most yeah. congested <laughs> air zones in the world. Yes. Yeah. How, how were ATC with that? With that? Were, they, were they happy with that? ATC was not happy with us at all about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so we got out uh, a few hours late, uh, which was unfortunate because that did push our track more to the north. Um, however, I mean, it provided some spectacular scenery. Uh, we went right past, uh, Mount Fuji, um, you know, relatively close to get some shots of Mount Fuji uh, wow. before the sun set that night. But there's also a lot of mountains in that area besides Fuji. Um, so we had to get a little bit of altitude just because the speeds were pretty strong at that point. And, um, and that did lead us into a track right over Tokyo. Fortunately, the time that we were coming in over Tokyo, allowed for us to cross through that airspace because it was the middle of the night. Um, most of the, uh, you know, international travel across the, the Pacific and stuff was not coming in or departing. So it was a good time to cross over. However, they still weren't happy about us crossing over <laughs> the airspace by any means. And one of the funny things with the air traffic uh, controllers was that we had set up in advance because, like you said, you were able to watch it on the computer. The whole world was able to watch everything live. I mean, it's as good as a transponder, really, <laughs> for, uh, for keeping an eye on everything. So what we had was we had an air traffic controller in Albuquerque at our, our command center that was dealing with air traffic control in between Japan and the U.S. And basically, um, we had told them in advance that you can go to the computer, you can follow everything here, or you can deal with our, our air traffic controller in Albuquerque and he'll keep you updated on everything. We were trying to reduce our workload on the balloon so that Leonid and I didn't have to be, you know, talking the whole time. Um, 
However, as we're coming into Tokyo, obviously, we're on the aircraft radio talking yeah. to them. We're squawking everything. We've got the transponder. <laughs> so that we're, we're all legal as far as that goes. Um, but uh, crossing over their airspace, once we, uh, we departed the shoreline, um, they didn't like our plan of uh, communicating with the command center. They, they wanted to talk to the aircraft. So for the first 40 hours, we're over the Pacific in the middle of nothingness, and yet they're wanting contact from us every 15 minutes to 30 minutes. <laughs> and so <laughs> that definitely increased the workload. When you have Japanese air traffic controllers that don't speak the best English, and then I've also got a Russian co-pilot who doesn't speak <laughs> the best English, and trying to, everybody's trying to communicate. And, uh, and so they were, uh, and the, the radios, you know, at that point as we got further out, even the HF radios, they were having a harder time, you know, getting us. So we were doing a lot of satellite phone calls and yeah. stuff to them as well. But, um, like I said, it was the first 40 hours of the flight. Once we crossed, um, uh, it's 165 east, I think, um, in the Pacific. Uh, then we entered into Oakland Center Control. And um, from that point on, all the way in, we never had to speak to anybody again. They dealt with our command center. So, And that's, a, so that's an amazing setup, having someone else being able to do that for you, take that pressure off. That's incredible, isn't it? Exactly. No, and that, that's... a. Uh, a huge, uh, huge deal when you're you're making a long crossing like that. You're trying to you know save your energy as much as you can because uh, you know it's going to be a long journey and long uh, and you're not at the top of your game anyway. You're yeah. very sleep deprived. It's cold. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of factors that play into that. So as you as you cross the coast of Japan, did did it cross your mind at any stage um, that you were basically a human version of like the World War Two Fugu balloons? <laughs> Oh yeah, no, no. I've studied a lot of the the Fugo balloons, uh, uh, you know, trajectories and what they did with that and everything. Um, I mean, they're the ones that really had shown uh, what the the jet stream was capable of doing and where, which way those winds were going. So yeah, it definitely uh, came into mind uh, <laughs> with all of that. So no it's, doubt. it's it said a lot, and it was also the case with those balloons. Is that it, it's it's pretty easy to get into the middle of the Pacific. But yes. once you get to the middle, then everything changes because you've got weather patterns Correct. that change and you can bend you quite substantially. You guys had that as well, didn't you? Because you, you were looking to go to Canada, but then ended up way down south instead. Yeah, correct. And so the weather pattern that we flew in, um, we knew that either was an option early on. Um, and so actually the very first um, weather trajectories or the trajectory programs and the weather patterns that everything that Luke sent me, had us going to Mexico. That, that's what we started with. Um, I sat down with my team in Japan. We, we looked at it. We analyzed it. And Luke, the one thing that he told me was, he goes, I can get you across. You're going to come to Mexico. Um, but could you be as high as you know 26,000 feet um, on that last night? Because you're probably going to be crossing over some convection. And then he said, I think that'll be the tops on this. Well, he's talking there again. It's almost 10 days out. Yeah, <laughs> he's yeah. talking about this forecast, and he's saying 26 at that point. And, you know, I'm doing the calculations, and I said, yes, we can be at 26,000. However, what if they go higher? You know, I mean, we're, we're pushing the limits of where we're going to be with ballast and what we have left and all this. And so I didn't feel real confident with that, that forecast. So I told Luke, I said, I don't, I don't like it. Then he said, well, let me, let me continue to work this. Let me see what I can do. So then he found that we could get a split, basically, um, after we crossed that midway point in the Pacific, and we could actually push up towards Canada. So Leonid and I both decided that that was the, the route that we wanted to try to take. So when we took off, our initial thought, and for the first several days of the flight, was we want that Canadian option. We're going to go that way, and we would have gone into Canada and then peeled it back down into the United States and uh, still got the distance, duration records, everything that we were, we were seeking. Um, but we felt it was a safer, safer option. Well, as we got closer to the coastline of the United States, it was very apparent that we wouldn't get that, uh, that wind that we wanted. We could have gone, we were at about 14,000 feet at that point, we had dropped quite a bit. We could go down uh, or we could stay where we were we were going to kind of continue to parallel the coast and just die in the Pacific off of the, not die, but the winds would die off there. <laughs> or, we could drop, or we could drop down and maybe get winds that would push us in towards the coast. And, and at this point, we're looking at like glass on the water down there. And it looks so nice. It's an incredible day for flying. Um, but the odds of keeping that and actually getting something that would take us in, at, you know, very few knots um, didn't seem very appealing. He said really the only viable option is to go higher, take it south, 
and we'll hook you back into Mexico. We, yeah. we, we still have that available. And uh, so we started calculating. Um, it was going to take another two days to do that. Um, but we were on the edge of what we had as far as supplies, ballast, everything on that. But it was like, what other choice do we have? So uh, we decided to take that. And one of the decision-making points on that was I felt – we're going south and we're paralleling the coast of the United States and into Mexico. And one of the busiest areas for our naval activities is off the coast of California. So I felt that survival was still doable, that you know we'd have rescue to us in short order. There's a lot of shipping lanes, a lot of military activity, a lot of stuff. So as long as we could keep it within about 500 miles of the coast, I felt that it was a very safe idea to try this. Whereas so, for the rest of the, like the previous part of the flight, you really don't have very many options at all, do you? If you, if you no. end up ditching, once you get 500 miles off the Japanese coast, from that yes. point until 500 miles from the U.S., you're on your yes. own, really. Yeah, it is. And my search and rescue people, we had experts on that as well in, in our command center. They said, if you go down in the mid-Pacific, it's not like searching for a needle in a haystack. It's a needle in a field full of haystacks because... <laughs> You're moving with the currents. Yeah. You're, you, it could take days to get anything, you know, any kind of rescue personnel out towards your position. And more than likely, you went down in not ideal conditions. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, you're pretty much, once you leave that 500-mile radius of any of the coastlines, um, you're, you're really taking on that risk of you're going to die if, if it doesn't work out. So, so in a, you said earlier, Troy, that you listened to the, the last episode of Barney Monkey with Brian Jones. Yes. So, and you might have heard Brian telling us a fantastic story about you in there about you cooking up <laughs> garden slugs in, in a survival yeah. method. Now, the problem when you're flying over the ocean is I don't think you've thought this through because there, there are no garden slugs in the ocean. There, exactly. I, yeah, we're or or did you take your own supply ready to pre-cook in, in the gondola <laughs> as you went through? Yeah, those were like our MREs there. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you're flying along. Um, obviously, then you realise you're heading down south. Um, you know, you you're in that last last night, and you had a very light balloon and yes. no ballast, and and yeah, the balloon we were, wouldn't come down. <laughs> yeah, we we um. So this this is the amazing part, and this is where I do really praise Luke on his uh, his weather forecasting abilities. And I, I actually wish he had been wrong. So, like I said, almost ten days in advance, he had said about thunderstorm activity um, off the coast of Mexico, um, you know, in tops 26,000 or whatever. And that last night, we watched a storm to the south of us. It, it hit basically as he had uh, predicted. Fortunately, we were starting to get that turn more to the east. And so we kind of came in paralleling the storm um, onto the coast of Mexico. But to the south of us that entire last night, we were watching lightning, uh, you know, to the south of our position. And... Um, yeah, we had taken off with um, nearly 10,000 pounds of uh, ballast um, out of Japan. We had lo less than 300 pounds left um, wow. at this point. Yeah. <laughs> so you so basically, uh, is that is that full, so if everything's going over the edge at this stage then, everything, yeah, chairs, so, batteries, whatever yeah, you've got? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So at the end, we were throwing over uh, the uh, oxygen tanks. Um, we had some propane tanks that we had... Uh, uh, used for the heater, so it's a, it's a straight gas balloon, so not not a rosier. But uh, we did have some propane tanks for heating, and uh, heating the capsule. Then we also had batteries. I mean, so yes, pretty much anything that was removable and that we didn't have any use for anymore was uh, was going overboard to uh, be able to stop us. So the problem was, we had a light balloon and daylight coming. So anybody that's done any gas ballooning knows, as the sun comes up, you're going to begin to get the superheating. And it's going to begin to expand the gas and get it very difficult to bring down. And this balloon was so large that uh, just the amount of valving was ridiculous to try to get it to even start down. <laughs> and then you worry about overvalving to where you're going to get a fast descent. And we don't have a lot of ballast left to try to slow that descent. So um, we worked really hard to uh, get the right amount of gas out to get it coming down. And finally, we did get into, uh, you know, reasonable descents. We never got into anything that was scary or overwhelming on the descent. And uh, we came in basically for a very nice landing. Unfortunately, it was four miles off the coast where <laughs> we were planning hitting the coast. <laughs> I, I was imagining in my head uh, a, a landing like Don and Rob had across the Atlantic, you know, hitting that first beat <laughs> as you come in. And my, 
my team is looking at it. They're Google Earthing. They're saying, oh, this is a great area to come into. Yeah, perfect place to hit the beach. And all of the weather models indicated as we came down, we would continue on that easterly track. It's just that the winds would continue to slow. Mm. And and it was doing it just as, as we had predicted, um, or, or they predicted. Um, we were at 20,000 feet dropping down. And everything was working perfectly except for about the last 1,500 feet when instead of continuing towards the coast, it began to parallel the coast. And um, that totally threw us off. Um, we came down, and we were already in a descent, so it wasn't like we were going to stop and go back up because we didn't have the ballast to do that. And so we came down through the trail ropes into the water, which slowed us down, turned us the right way, and, and just set us on the water just gentle as can be. I mean, it was a very gentle landing. Um, so we're on the water with the balloon still inflated uh, above us and just heading to the south. So we're never going to get any closer to Mexico than we are at this point. So after, after a little bit of time, finally, I, I told Leonid that uh, let's get prepared to you know, deflate the balloon and cut it loose. And um, so that's what we did. We knew there were a lot of um, fishing boats in the area we'd seen on the way in. So we knew rescue would be very close. It yeah. wasn't going to be a, a difficult thing to, to get us picked up. And was it like we all looked at that and went, like those pictures that you've got um, with just the balloon sitting on the water, you know, uh -huh. looking with the, the beautiful sunrise and everything that's happening, they're just stunning photos. Like it's just a magical, a magical yeah. couple of photos. But was it bittersweet to, to claim the records for your distance and durations you set out to do it, but not to make land? Um, no, uh, not, not, from my, <laughs> not, not from my point of view. Um, the, 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 the bad part about landing in the sea is I have a strong propensity for sea sickness. And so that, that was the part that bothered me more than anything. I hate, I hate sailing. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, that was um, uh, when we came down and we hit in the command center. Uh, my wife was there. I mean, we had a full command center at that point. Every volunteer in Albuquerque that was part of the project was there. They're all watching. They see it hit, and I think it actually went down a few feet beyond, you know, sea level uh, on the on the tracker, and so they're all looking at it, and they're looking at each other, and and uh, then they look at my wife Tammy, and um, they said, "Well, what now?" And she goes, "He'll call me." <laughs> and, so, and, uh, and so yeah, my first text to her was, "I hate sailing." <laughs> so then she knew I knew I was okay, and let everybody else know that, but. Uh, but Really, what we were after um, on this flight was, I was after the records that Ben and Maxie had sent, uh, set nearly you know four decades prior. Yeah. Um, and I was able to, Leonid and I were able to beat the duration record and the distance record, and by very large margins as well. And so, really, what the Pacific was was the arena for going after those records. There's very few places in the world geographically that you can get that kind of distance yeah. um, and still end up in a place that's uh, you know, suitable for a landing. So, so really it was all about going for the records that we ended up in the water. I knew that was okay. It's, there's been several records that have ended in the water and still got the record. Yeah, it's, still a re it's still a record. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, and, a better, I, and a better story, I think. A much better story and much better photos. Yes. Uh, so... I was thinking about this and, you know, I was thinking about Double Eagle 2 and, and 5 and thinking about these flights. And, you know, that's 40 years ago, almost 40 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. it, it must, it, like back in that day, it would have been inconceivable, really, uh, to have the record completed by a combination of Russian and American pilots. Oh, exactly. Like, so much has changed in that time. We, with, with Leonid, did you guys talk about that at all in the flight? Like that this was really a... Like oh, bringing the community together type of thing? Oh, no, totally. That That's one of my, my favorite things of this flight was that it was truly an international record. Um, you know, we, we took off in Japan with all of our friends that are balloonists there in Saga. We uh, ended up in Mexico. Escondra, who runs the Leon event, was there to help you know, capture us there. Um, you know, it's a Russian-U.S. team. We had a Belgian meteorologist. We had people in Switzerland and Germany running trajectories as well. So, yeah, it brought together the ballooning community in a way that uh, I think is really hard to do on, a, on one project like that. You know, um, even during the Gordon Bennett, you're cheering for your country, you know, mm. or whatever. <laughs> this brought everybody into one, one event, and 
um, got everyone excited about one flight. So, yeah, that was a big deal for both Leonid and I. And one of one of my favorite quotes is actually one of your quotes, Troy, about the flight, was where you said, our success was achieved on the human level, not the national level. I, I really, yes. I really love that quote. I think that really sums up the flight really well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. In, in a lot of the articles that I've read, I obviously do a bit of research before I talk to our guests, and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of reading I've done about you, the word that keeps coming up, and when I hear you talk about yourself on some videos and stuff like that as well, mm -hmm. the word that keeps coming up is belief, not in a religious sense, but just belief in, in yourself. It seems you've got yeah. like, a, like an absolute you know, commitment and trust in what you set your mind to. You say, this is what I'm going to do, and you just go and do it. Is, is yeah. that belief what sets you apart, you think, from, from other people trying to do these things? It, it probably is a big part of that because, yes, if you don't have that belief, um, you know, and and true belief in not only yourself, but the, the team, the equipment, uh, the forecasting, I mean, um, you, you'd be you'd be foolhardy to uh, to attempt some of these things. You know, I mean, that's where it does become dangerous then. So, yeah, I, uh, I do believe uh, that my belief in all of my my team and my equipment um, has really led to my success because. Um, I wouldn't go off and do it. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not an adrenaline rush junkie. I'm a very, uh, calculated risk kind of guy. Um, I got a family that wants to see me, you know, um, I, there's more to come home to than uh, just, uh, an award or a trophy. And that's a great leading. Cause the other thing I wanted to ask you was about, is about that risk profile. Cause obviously the risk you're taking are calculated risks. You understand the system. Uh, you understand what you're actually getting yourself into, but, um, since you've become a dad and, and you've got the kids, that has your has your risk profile changed? Like what you're prepared to do now as before kids? Um, no, I don't think it, I don't think it really has changed um, because I, I I approached every project even before my children in the same way. Um, you know, it was always uh, to be as risk risk averse, but uh, you know, with success as my target. Um, as possible, so I don't think I've really changed my mindset, and and I'm really hoping that I've passed that those skills and and thought processes on to them as well, so that anything they approach, and uh, you know, it's not even just in ballooning; it's whatever you do in life that uh, you know to to try to take that same kind of a an outlook and uh, and what's the what the risk reward there, and uh, I think both of my kids have kind of uh, bought that bought into that and and, pl and put it into their own lives. Maybe they'll be the ones giving you a bit more grey hair as uh, as you get older. They're oh, I, I'd almost I'd almost guarantee my daughter will for sure. <laughs> <laughs> she's, so, she, she's already saying, looking at the records. So, what, one of the things I think in these attempts, I talked about team before, but that's one of the things I really love about the way you've gone about two eagles, particularly, is that it, it, like it, it's really keeping people engaged. It's it's your dream. It's mm -hmm. um, uh, dream of a couple of others, but you've got this huge team, and you really need to to get their belief with you, your yes. belief again, uh, but really mm -hmm. to take them on the journey with you and to keep them engaged mm -hmm. and empowered. How do you how do you go about that? How do you sort of make sure that everybody is ready to go with you when you are? Yeah, and and it is a tough deal because um, you know it's not only um, it's belief, but just uh, the limit limited amount of time that people have to devote to things like this. Um, because, like I said, the majority of my team was all all volunteer, um, and so yes, they have to want it as badly as you do, but also realizing that they have real lives and things that they have to be able to do, and um, and so I am so grateful to everybody that you know worked with us on all of this because to keep that kind of enthusiasm, I don't know what I do to to bring that to them, but they do stick with me and they stuck through the whole thing. Um, Leonid and I had actually had a conversation that, you know, after two canceled attempts out of Saga, um, we talked about we're wearing our volunteers out. I mean, these people are leaving their job, <laughs> coming out and spending 24 hours, you know, putting the balloon together and then getting a last minute cancellation and having to put it away and uh, coming out and doing it again. And, and so we started talking about, you know, uh, well, maybe we need to hire people instead of, you know, uh, having the volunteers. but. Those volunteers never went away. They they were there. Our command center was staffed by people that were not only out of Albuquerque but came in from Phoenix and Austin and um, and you know as soon as they got to go they were they were there for it. So I wish I knew what I did to do that. I think it's just everybody had such a 
strong belief that uh, we were going to do this and they were excited about you know going after those records as well. I think different people have different levels of adventure as well and so some people don't could never do what you guys have done in the actual piloting of it but yeah. by being involved in some way or contributing it allows yes. people to feel like they're they're having an adventure as well. Would you agree with yep. that? I, I totally agree with that and um, you know and and um, and throughout everything that I've done and wherever I've spoken or uh, received awards, uh, you know, we've made sure that they were all um, getting that as well because it's a total team effort. There's, it's impossible to do something of this nature without having a dedicated team that uh, has the same belief that you do. And, um, yeah, so I, I think uh, most of them probably wouldn't go and do what I, <laughs> what I do, but uh, we're, we're very happy to be a, be a part of it in, in whatever way. And I couldn't do it without all of their, their skill sets. You know, I, I can't run the whole thing. I can only go fly it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just throwing out another idea, do you, do you think a solo gas crossing of the Pacific is achievable? Um, there's uh, there's several ways to do it. There, again, is finding the right weather pattern for the right, right system. And um, that's where, again, I think you have to look at the risk of what you're doing and what's, what's possible with the, the system that you have that each have limitations. And I tell everybody, you know, if you want to go across the Atlantic, I mean, it's cro been crossed, I think, 18 or 19 times now <laughs> since that first double eagle uh, flight. Mm. Um, but really, to do it safely, if you just want to go have the adventure, and, and it's still just as hard to do, um, but the, the models have changed, the, the, the way we look at weather, everything, that I think it can be done safely but it should be done with a rosier. Um, that's, you know, that's really the, the way to do on, on any of these things. If you're looking to really have the system to do it, I believe the rosier is the best possible system. Now, when we did the two eagles, the entire reason that we did that was because um, I had had this dream in my head for so many years of trying to duplicate what Ben and Maxie had done, you know, so many years before when I was a kid. And, once the around the world had been done, I was the part of several around the world teams, you know, for, for attempts that uh, yeah. people were trying to undertake. However, um, once it was done, the very following morning after Brightling Orbiter 3 made it around, um, Richard Abruzzo and I had actually been working on our own project for the following year. We were, we were working towards that. Um, we had been part of a team called Spirit of Peace that didn't launch out of Albuquerque uh, that season. So we thought, okay, well, once that one wrapped up, we're going to go off and try it again ourselves, you know, form our own team. And uh, the day after the Brightling went down, I got a call from Richard, and he says, let's go to breakfast. And, uh, and Richard <laughs> was extremely competitive, and he was just pissed off. I mean, he was really, <laughs> he, was, he was mad that somebody had made it before and a Bruto had done or something. You know? And so I actually, the day after Brightling landed, I threw this idea out to Richard, and I said, I know they did it, but, you know, there's still a lot of other records out there. And one that I've looked at is your father's records, of, you know, distance and duration on, on straight gas. And um, he almost kind of gave me an incredulous look of, no, I'm not going after those. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we kind of split up on that and didn't, uh, didn't end up teaming up. But um, it, it stuck in my head that that was one of the, the next really uh, big records to, to try to go after. So it... Uh... Next, next thing is AM7 followed by that? Uh, AM7 is a possibility. Um, we've got a, a hot air balloon. We're looking at hot air duration now as well. Um, and, you know, as my daughter's getting uh, more into this, there's a possibility that we may start looking at some of the, the feminine records or things that she's wanting to, to try to go after. So I was having a look I'm at some of the records coming into this interview, Troy, and uh, uh, it strikes me that there's a lot of those feminine records that are very very achievable and yes correct and especially for someone who's a bit smaller uh, so it, when you're younger and a bit lightweight it's probably the perfect time to, to have a real swing at some of those so maybe there'll be more bradley's yeah. in the record book soon yeah well and we have uh we have a lot of that equipment that was built you know specifically for my projects that's mm. sitting around so it should get in the air again for something <laughs> <laughs> All right, mate, that's fantastic. Look, thank you so much for your time. There's, there's, I could talk to you all day about all the stuff you've done, but no one's going to listen to it if it goes for three or four hours. Go. So, well, thank you. so thank you so much. And look, the, the thing that I really love is your your passion for adventure and, and, and sharing that adventure to make other people look at it and go, well, you know, 
I'm, I'm just a normal person who's just gone and done some extraordinary things with a lot of planning and a great team. Yes, yeah. that, that, and that's why I was trying to tell people I'm, I'm just a, I'm a regular balloonist out there too. I still love flying every day. Um, you know, I'm a balloon guy. It's a, it's not about the records. It's about going out and, and pushing yourself for whatever you can. And so I do encourage anyone to go out and uh, push, push their personal best. And if they really get into it, you know, go for those world records. And if, if we're traveling around the world, Troy, and people want to come and fly with the sky god that is yourself, where can they find you and how do they, how do they go flying with you? Yeah, please. Um, they, can, they can find me uh, either. They can go off of my website, uh, balloonigbradleys.com. Or um, I'm the chief pilot for Rainbow Riders here in Albuquerque. So please, anybody that comes to town, love to, you know, hook up for a, a flight or at least go have a beer. We're always up for a beer here at Arnie Monkey. That's how we roll. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Troy, thank you so much for your time and for, for really going through some of those experiences and incredible life spent in ballooning. And, congr- and uh, all the best for whatever comes next. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Hi again. Well, I hope you enjoyed the interview as much as I did. Just a reminder that you can subscribe to Auntie Monkey via the website www.auntiemonkey.com. You can also subscribe through iTunes or on your Android podcasting app if you really don't like Apple gear. Keep sharing Auntie Monkey on Facebook so that we can make sure as many people as possible can listen. If you write for a local ballooning magazine, why not put in a little plug for us in there as well? In return, you'll receive some great karma. You can give us feedback or suggest guests for us on our Facebook site at www.facebook.com forward slash auntiemonkey666 or even ask us why we have the number of the beast on our Facebook URL. Thanks for listening.